the third paper will deal with um, the question that has been put to me by <clears throat> one of your leaders. How do we deal with the challenges Islam presents to Christians and to the church in Kenya? That, of course, is a wide uh, topic. And um, so I will deal with a number of, of issues and hope that it is uh, relevant. And uh, I hope that there will be time for, for um, uh, question and answers. Jeff, if you could let me know again. I think I'm already later than I should, I'm supposed to be. Until what time do I have for the paper? Um, it's now 10. Okay, so it's, we plan to end up the entire session um, by 11 o'clock in Germany time, in German time. Okay. So I should uh, maybe 40 minutes paper and 20 minutes. Uh, question and answer. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I Thank will you. do that. Thanks. Uh, one of the problems that um, we have here in Germany and you probably will have in, in uh, Kenya as well. Many Christians have misconceptions about Muslims. Um, some people think, oh, Muslims are just the same. Very similar belief in God. So it's basically the same way and with differences, but we are, we are brothers and sisters believing in God. Others say, no, they're all terrorists. And so you have different approaches, even among Christians, uh, to Islam. And therefore, it is important to, to understand the issues well, which you have as a country living together, um, different religions among the Muslims, different Muslim communities, Shia, Ahmadiyya, Sunni, maybe some sects. Um, and of course, there are issues on the social level, on the level of society, on the level of living with one another. And the question is, what kind of problems might Islam create as a faith and as a religion that has political ambitions or that deals with moral problems or ethical issues in a different way than other religions. And so uh, there can be conflict and it is important to understand what the conflicts could be and also where conflicts don't need to appear. And the better we understand each other on these levels, um, the, the easier it is to live together. So it's, um, again, important to understand there is a big variety of different views in um, Islam. And we should never assume that every Muslim is the same or that there is just one type or one kind of Muslim. The second issue that we need to understand is that um, Islam is a post 
Christian religion. And that at the beginning, Muhammad encountered Christians, encountered Jews, and dealt with Jews and dealt with Christians and had a particular view on Christians, had discussions with Christians, knew something about Christianity, but much of it also misunderstood about Christianity. And that all is mirrored in the Quran. And one aspect is particularly important to understand that Muhammad, who wanted to be acknowledged actually by the Jews, was not acknowledged by the Jews. They rejected his prophethood. And with regard to Christianity, he wanted to show that Islam as a post-Christian religion was improving and correcting Christianity. Though Islam has an anti-Christian focus, meaning denying, no, Jesus was not divine. He was simply a human. He was simply, uh, simply um, a messenger. No, of course not. The Bible is not inspired. And in some ways, what you read in the Quran is an attempt to change things around and to correct Christianity. And in that sense, there is an anti-Christian uh, focus. And that makes it at times difficult for, for talking to, to, to Muslims. And that at times create an attitude of Muslims who say, oh, in the end, and that is true, uh, conviction of the Muslims, that eventually the whole world will be ruled by Muslims, that Islam will at the end of the time be the only religion that still exists. All people have either to embrace Islam uh, or they will be killed. So Muslims come with that, many who are engaged in political Islam come with that understanding we will be the rulers of the world at the end. We'll take our time, we'll go through the process, but we are, we know who we are. So in that sense, it is um, at times difficult to deal with Muslims, particularly on a Muslim, on a, on a political and societal uh, level. Um, just to give you an example of that. I've here a Quran in English published in Saudi Arabia. And I found it very, very interesting reading it and reading the first surah. Now the first surah is very important for the Muslims. It's almost like in the Christian faith of the, our father. It is a prayer or it's a, it's a, uh, uh, verses for, seven verses from the scriptures that a pious Muslim will recite several times a day. And the two last verses I, I read to you, that it says, guide us to the straight way. And then it finishes the way of those on whom you have bestowed your grace. That are the Muslims. The way of those who have bestowed your grace. Not the way of those who earned your anger. 
and not the, the, the way of those who went astray. And in that, that Quran, in the text of the Quran, they put a bracket, brackets there. And in the bracket, if I read the, the verse with bracket, it says, the way of those on whom you have bestowed your grace and not the way of those who earned your anger, in brackets, such as the Jews, and not of those who went astray. And in brackets behind that, such as the Christians. And you can understand, if someone reads that often, he's fully convinced, yes, the Jews, the Israelis, God's anger is on, on them, and he will hate them. And the Christians are those who went astray, who falsified their scriptures, who who do who are sinful and so that is quite deeply ingrained uh, in the uh, muslim faith in muslims and that can create problems in living together now for those for whom islam is simply a personal faith it, uh, it is not so important. Yes, they believe, yeah, the Christians are kafir. Um, and that's the reason why in approaching them and dealing with them, it's very important that they can see in us something, honesty and decency and love and concern and, and uh, so on, so that negative attitudes will diminish and they will become more open in listening to us. Uh, but it's important to understand that <clears throat> for that reason, for that understanding of who the Christians are, there is this anti-Christian um, anti focus in Islam. And particularly if then, Muslims are politically interested and go into what is called Islamism or political Islam, then uh, the, there are other problems which we need to understand and uh, which um, make at times the integration of Muslim communities in, in the country more difficult. So I will take up uh, several issues. The first one is the issue of democracy. Democracy has a particular um, definition. Um, it, the word itself consists of of two words, demos, Greek words, demos, the people, and kratos, the rule. And democracy means that the rule in a country emanates or comes directly from the people. And the rule is exercised by the people. It's the people who put a government into power by election, free election, fair elections. So the majority of the people will decide the con uh, the, the, what the government looks like. And democracies are characterized by a division of power. You have the government, that's the executive, 
you have the parliament of different parties, and that's the legislative. It creates uh, the laws of the countries. You have the constitution of the countries. You have the individual laws. And if the government wants to create new laws, it has to bring it through parliament. And you have the judiciary, the third power, which is must be independent so that even politicians can be called to account. That is a concept that is foreign to Islam. Because the law that actually Muslims have to follow is God's law. Now the Quran does not really define how the government look like. So we only have the model of Muhammad himself. And Muhammad in Medina from 622 to his death in 632, he was a military ruler. He would create the laws. He was a ruler. Um, he was a spiritual leader. He was everything in one person. And it was God who would determine. It, so he would put in law what he believed God was saying. And that, uh, of course, if you have a Muslim who believes this, you can realize that it can cause problems in a democracy. And um, that you find Islamists and those who are more extreme in that sense, who certainly would want to change a democracy into a theocracy where the law of Allah would rule. Um, again, you have to understand not every Muslim thinks that uh, in that way. As I mentioned, you have Muslims who simply are interested in the spiritual side of Islam and have no um, political aspirations in that sense. They want to live in peace and want to live their lives. They don't have a problem with democracy. But everyone who wants to cut out in a country out of the societal room as much power as possible for Islam. And would eventually, if the Muslims would have the majority, get rid of democracy, you can imagine that this would cause problems in a country. So even the issue of the term and the concept of democracy, it is not shared by all Muslims. And you will find, maybe also in Kenya, I don't know, Muslims who would want to get rid of uh, democracy and live under Sharia law. We have already mentioned, and I will shorten that, um, that Christians are being viewed as kafir, as those, I mean, some would go as far as saying the Christians are firewood for the hell. They will all end up in hell. Others uh, would not say that, at least not so openly. But basically, as a kafir, you are not meant to be in paradise. One reason why they say that is they believe that Islam is the real, the genuine first religion. That is what is the right religion. And of course, they realize there are differences in Judaism, 
in Jewish religion and in Christianity. And the only option for them is God, who is merciful, has sent his messengers also to the Jews. Moses was sent to the Jews. Isa was sent to the Christians. If now Judaism and Christianity are different from Islam, the only solution for them is, oh, they falsified it. They falsified scriptures. They falsified their beliefs. Ah, oh, them, they're kafir. They don't come to pray, they don't go to pray paradise. Um, just to give you one example. In John 14, verse uh, 16, and also in John 15 and 16, Jesus speaks about the comforter whom he will send that he will not leave us as, an, as orphans, but he will prepare room for us, but he will send the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And of course, some of the Islamic uh, theologians have read that. And the Greek word that is being used here is parakletos the one who is being called to my side, who is my advocate, who is interceding for me, who is helping me. And the Muslims say, this word parakletos has been changed in the beginning of Christianity. And the word that should stand here is not parakletos, but peri. Peri, um, uh, just a moment, periclutos, periclutos. And periclutos would mean the honored one, the admired one, the honorable one. And they say that exactly is the name of Muhammad. Saying, aha, Jesus in John 14 and 15 and 16, he did not speak about the Holy Spirit and Trinity. No, he spoke that Muhammad would come and that Muhammad would teach us and that we all should become Muslims. It's a clever argumentation, but of course there's no, no uh, indication whatsoever that this word has been changed and it would have been very difficult. There are now about 5,000 manuscripts worldwide um, and to change everyone, uh, they would have to explain how, how that happened and why that happened and how that would have happened. But just to, to let you know the, the, um, the uh, argumentation between Parakletos and Periclutos. So that's the reason why they often feel that Christians are kafir. Next point, human rights. In December 1948, the United Nations General Assembly um, decided on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And it consists of 30 articles and defines basic rights and basic liberties. And the first article states, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights, and they are endowed with reason and a moral conscience and should meet one another in spirit of fraternity. So actually the Human Rights Declaration says that we in a, in a country, in society, although we might have different beliefs, but we are, we are equal, we are, we are the same, and there should be equal rights. And it cannot be that one, one community rules over the other. Um, because basically, of course, the, human, the United Nations uh, uh, follows the path of democracy. 
that there should be harmony and there should be the, the rule of the majority, but it should be orderly, it should be according to a constitution that has been agreed by all, and it should be with in the independent judiciary. Uh, today in Islam, you have three different schools or groups of people. There are those um, who say, no, democracy is a Western concept and we don't want that. And they insist that uh, they only would follow the law of God. Yes, as Christians, we do to a degree the same. Yes, we would honor laws of our countries, but if let's say a law of our country gets into conflict with what God says, we too would say, yes, like Paul and John, it's more important to obey God than it is uh, a government. And in, Ger in Germany, under Hitler, we had a, 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 a dictatorship and Christians were torn. Do I obey the laws of that uh, or dictator or do I obey God? when this di di dictator wants to kill all Jews or wants to di 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 kill all homosexuals or wants to uh, kill all, all uh, psychiatric patients, which Hitler did. And there Christians and churches had to make a decision whom to follow when there is a conflict between what God says and what uh, the government says. And uh, the same you would have in other dictatorships. Uh, our Korean brothers and sisters in North Korea would have a similar uh, situation, or people in Russia would have the situation, or in China would have the situation. So, but the Muslims would go a step further and would reject democracy and would only want to. Um, uh, to, uh, to obey God's law and would want to implement God's law. And of course, in God's law, Muslims and non-Muslims are not the same. Men and women are not the same. And uh, minorities and the majority are not the same. And therefore you get, if you have a, a Muslim majority rule a country, you get into certain conflict areas that relate to human rights. Again, that does not apply to all Muslims. It applies to those who have political aspirations and who believe that in the end, Islam should rule a country and should rule the world. Uh, you should also understand that the Quran, for example, says the Muslim Ummah, the Muslim community, it's a worldwide community, is the best of all communities. And if that best community rules the world, then we have peace. And so you might have idealistic Muslims who truly believe that if everyone believes in Islam, then there would be a better, better world and a better country. Um, so you have these problems with human rights uh, at certain levels, and it's important to understand that. You might be aware that because the Muslim countries, and there are 57 countries in the world united in the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, also in the Muslim uh, League, um, that are Muslim majority countries. 
And they have actually rejected the Universal Declaration of, of um, Human Rights. They might not have done that openly, but the Muslims have created their own Declaration of Human Rights for the Muslims. And if you read them, you can find them on the internet and it's interesting to read them. Many of the articles look quite similar to the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights, but every time and particularly again at the end, it says this only applies as long as it does not contradict Sharia law. So the human rights would only be applied and only apply in the frame and within Sharia law. Sharia law is above the human rights. And for that reason, because that is, has become acceptable in uh, Islamic countries, you will find issues where you think, oh, how can they do that? And they simply do it because they have basically pushed the Human Rights Declaration, the Universal Human Rights Declaration, at the side, put in their own Human Rights Declaration and said, no, it only applies as long it doesn't contradict the Sharia law. So that is important, something to, to know. Another issue that also um, um, applies to human rights and democracy, to the human right of the, the freedom of religion. And it's defined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that freedom of religion is not only that I am free to believe whatever I want, it also says I have the freedom to testify, to preach my religion, to witness to my religion. So missionary work within the context of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is allowed. And the freedom of religion also says you are allowed to change your religion. You have the right not to have a religion, to be an atheist. These rights, of course, a Muslim um, majority country would never give. And therefore in all Muslim majority countries, either the government would step in if someone converts to Christianity, like in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, or the family would create, uh, step in, or society would create, uh, step in. They would not allow apostates. I had a student um, who became uh, uh, from the northern tip of, of Sumatra, from Aceh, former Muslim. And when he became a Christian, he was thrown out of the family, thrown out of the village, thrown out of his clan. And uh, at one time, two of his uncles came and drank tea with him, put their knives on the table and said, we have been sent to kill you, but we have decided not to do so. But we demand that you never return to our province and never approach again one of our family members. I have another friend here in, in Germany from Sudan. He was a Muslim. One, I think his grandfather uh, was one of the founders of the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Sudan, in Khartoum. When he was seven years old, he learned for two years the, the whole um, Quran, 
by heart. And he was a fervent Muslim, but he became a Christian. He was thrown out of the family. The family in Khartoum wrote a big page in the daily newspapers, Our Son Died. They created a grave in the graveyard. And so my friend stood in front of his own grave where he was supposed to lie in. That's the way how strict Sharia law oriented people deal with apostates, with those who leave Islam. And of course, it's a, it's a human rights issue. Indonesia was different, at least under, <clears throat> under, under the president I lived under, President Suharto. I have heard him in a big stadium with 80,000 uh, Christian, no, 60,000 uh, uh, Christian present. He said, in our country, every Muslim, he is allowed, if he wants to become a Christian, and every Christian is allowed to become a Muslim. That is quite unusual for a country where 80% of the population are Muslims. It has to do with a particular brand of Islam, the Javanese uh, Islam, which is less orthodox, is mere, more of a mixture, very interested in harmony. And for that president, it was also a political issue. But it's important to know how uh, most Islam deals with, uh, with uh, apostates, with those who leave Islam. Another issue of human rights is how to deal with women. And of course, uh, in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, men and women are equal. Yes, culturally, there might be differences in how we, we handle our families that, that is uh, allowed to. But in front of the law, both are the same. Not so in Muslim countries. Uh, for one, the Quran states quite clearly in, in Surah 4, men are superior. They are the protectors and maintainers of women. And for that reason, Allah has made them superior to women. And that becomes practical. If there is a conflict in the courts, the testimony of two women is equal to the testimony of one man. That means the testimony of a man counts more. And if there's one man and one woman, the man will always win. And for girls, they would only get half of the inheritance to that what boys get. Um, the man can easily, they can have four women, uh, four wives, and can easily uh, divorce a woman. But in a Muslim majority country, the woman could not get a divorce from a man. The man says no. Or the man says, four times, you are divorced, you're divorced, and the wife has to go. So men and women are not equal in many practical ways. And for example, that's important. If, for example, a Muslim woman converts and becomes a Christian and she has children from a Muslim man, the children will be taken away from her in a Muslim country. Because the children are supposed to be Muslims and they can't stick with a, with a Christian woman. So they, they will stay with a Muslim father. In Egypt, there's a case of a famous professor and he was attacked by Islamist Muslims in Egypt. And eventually he was forced, he was called an infidel as a Muslim. 
and the court ordered him to divorce or asked the women to leave him. And the women too, his wife was a professor too. So the two had no other choice. They emigrated to Holland in order to be able to stay married. So that is part of the Sharia law and that goes against human rights. And it's good to know these, these practical issues. And there are other issues of inequality, forced marriages, female circumcision, the social control, uh, and all these issues. Another point uh, with regard to Muslim majority countries or issues that can become a problem in countries with a growing Muslim minority, uh, the Islamic anti-Semitism. Not every Muslim hates Jews, but in a situation where in political respect, there is a lot of talk between Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, there is more and more uh, hatred being stirred and it comes to the forefront. But it has also to do with the Quran and it has to do with the life of Muhammad. Muhammad was called to go to Medina and to be the arbitrator, arbitrator, uh, arbitra, the, the political, political uh, the, the coach for the different tribes who lived in Medina. And there were two Muslim, two uh, polytheist tribes and three Jewish tribes. And the polytheists became Muslims and uh, Muhammad was the leader the politician, the ruler, the spiritual leader, and so on. And there were several wars between Medina, the Muslims, and Mecca, the non-Muslims, who had persecuted Muhammad. And Muhammad had fled from Mecca to Medina. And in these fights, the Jews did not always support Muhammad. They rejected his, his prophethood. They ridiculed him. They didn't help him. So Muhammad turned against the Jews. The first two of the Jewish tribes were chased away from Medina. The first one still was able to take their riches with them. The second one had to leave everything behind. And the third one, about between 800 and 900 men and boys were killed, decapitated. And the girls and the women were sold in the, in the, into slavery. And there are other aspects in the life of Muhammad where he conquered the, the oasis of Kaiba, which is north of um, Mecca, Medina, and he killed everyone. There were a strong Jewish community and he killed them all. And he took a Jewish wife after he had killed the husband of that woman and the father of the woman. And even today, at times, you hear Muslims shout in Israel, Kaiba, Kaiba. And they want to remind the Jews of what happened in the oasis of Kaiba by Muhammad. And if you look into the Quran, you will find uh, verses that Allah was angry with the Jews and that he would turn Jews into pigs and into dogs. And that at the end times, every tree and every, every stone would cry out, oh, there is a Jew behind me, kill him. So there is an anti-Jewish element in the uh, Muslim religion and uh, there's hatred. 
That doesn't mean again that every Muslim hates Jews. You will find even Muslims who uh, have uh, Jewish friends. That can happen. But those who are directed by Sharia law, who are directed by the Quran in these areas, will turn against uh, Muslims. So you find uh, quite a lot of uh, Muslim anti Semitism uh, in. I don't know whether in your country, but here in the West, it's quite strong and it plays a role in, in the living together here. Another point uh, in living together with a growing Muslim minority is the issue of jihad and violence. Islam is often associated in the minds of non-Muslims with jihad. For that reason, we need to understand what it means. Islam is not in itself holy war. The word itself means actually only a, a struggle in the path or in following Allah. And the Muslims speak about the big jihad and the small jihad. And they actually mean that for most Muslims, the fight is a spiritual fight to be a better Muslim. Moral purity, to be a good husband, to be honest, all this is, is, is meant by jihad. But yes, if you look into the Sharia law and into the um, Quran, uh, jihad also means uh, fighting for Muslim. According to the Muslim rules, it should be a defensive fight only when Islam or Muslim countries are attacked. But if you look into history, that was certainly not always the case. In the first four years of, of um, Islam, Islamic history, I mean, uh, Arabic uh, armies conquered the whole Middle East, the whole of North Africa. They entered Spain, they conquered Spain, they stood in France and were attacking uh, Europe. They conquered the, the Balkans. They conquered uh, big parts of India. They conquered uh, Central Asian countries. So this was not defensive. So you have to understand what defensive means. If I invite you to become a Muslim and you read, uh, become a Christian, uh, sorry, if I as a Muslim invite you to become a Muslim and you as a Christian say three times no, then you are attacking me. And I'm, I'm allowed to, to defend myself and might even do it with violence. So that is an argumentation by political uh, Muslims, which is, can be quite dangerous. And uh, we, in, in talking to political activists, you would have to ask what he really means and really try to understand uh, uh, the, the real meaning of what they say. But it's good to know that there might be problems. Doesn't mean that there always are problems. It only say there can be problems. And we have, to, as, a, as a state, as a, as a country, as a government, we have to look into that. Um, in Germany or in Europe, generally, Muslims are still a minority. And because being a minority, they compromise, of course. And they justify that in that way, theologically. But if you read their books, particularly if it is in their original languages, 
and it's not meant really for uh, the outside consumption, but it's meant for Muslims, then you realize that they cling to the conviction, no, we should be living under Sharia law. And in every country, Sharia law should decide so that eventually, as Allah promised, eventually the whole world should be ruled by Islam. So those more extreme political activists pursue that goal. And it's always good to understand where people are. The percentage of those who really pursue that type of, of, uh, of um, politics is not the majority of the Muslims. It's a smaller, but it's a decisive, it's a vocal uh, and quite active minority. And it's good to know about it. Another point, uh, moderate Muslims and Ijtihad. You find also, and it's good to know that, we have that in Germany, that you find more and more Muslims who want to save Islam and just keep it as a personal faith and wants to separate the spiritual issue and the political issue. And say, if you want to be a political activist, don't do that as a Muslim, do it as a, as a citizen of this country. And the problem is that they, of course, are, when they say so, very easily attacked by Orthodox Muslims or by Islamists and say, you are not a proper Muslim. So the only way to really modernize Islam and to be a moderate Muslim is that the interpretation of uh, the Quran and the tradition is being changed. We have a professor here in Germany, uh, he's a Lebanese, and he wrote a book, Islam is mercy. And if you read it, you think, and I've, I've heard him speak, and he's, he's a very honest man, very moderate man. Um, and I'm sure he's a very decent man. And um, when you read his book, you think, oh, that person must have read the New Testament. Some of the formulations of what he writes sounds very, very similar to, to, to the Bible. And I'm sure he means it honestly. Um, I've seen other uh, Muslim leaders who try to, to state what needs to be abolished in Islam in order that Muslim can really in harmony live together with Christians, with other, um, with other religions and to have real peace together and be really a fraternity within the, the society. The only way is really to reinterpret the Quran. I've read there's a book written by for actually by a Muslim theologian, by a Catholic theologian who lived in Turkey. And he wrote about four different Muslim theologians and their theology and how what they taught in Turkey. And you realize they all had studied hermeneutics, Christian hermeneutics, and how we interpret the Bible. And they try to, to apply that in Islamic hermeneutics and the way how you interpret uh, the Quran. They all got into trouble 
they all were attacked and they all changed back to an orthodox Islamic way of interpreting. It shows it is not easy to transform certain concepts and beliefs of, of uh, Islam because they are deeply ingrained and uh, any Islamist or any orthodox Muslim can attack a moderate one and accuse him of not being a true Muslim. And he can quote the Quran, he can quote the tradition, and that puts a lot of societal and social pressure on Muslims and makes it so difficult to leave and to change and to live in to live a, a, a model type of, of Muslims. And up till now, it is basically at this time only possible in Western countries where you should have an independent uh, judiciary and where you have laws and where you can have, where you are defended um, if, if uh, other Muslims attack you. So it, it makes it very difficult that there are problems in uh, this issue and uh, that for this reason, it's right that Christians and churches are concerned about a growing, uh, a growing um, Muslim community in their country. Um, even when Muslims again and again emphasize, oh no, Islam is a religion of peace, you have to understand what it means. It means, yes, if eventually all people are Muslims, there is peace, there's harmony. And that is in the, in the background that a, a, a politically minded Muslim who believes in Sharia law will cling to that, that in the end, Islam will rule and the world will be ruled by Islam. And in that sense, yes, then there will be peace. Um, so the question uh, stays, how should we, what should we do? How should we encounter that? I think there are a few things which we can do. We should try to understand Islam, the different types. We should try to understand Muslims, individuals. We should try to cooperate with the moderate ones, with those who see Islam as their personal faith uh, and don't have an, a political agenda or political aspirations. We should dialogue with uh, moderate Muslims uh, where we can cooperate, where we can help each other. There is a book in English in England written by or edited by Steve Bell and Colin Chapman. And it's titled Between Naivety and Hostility. And I think that summarizes what we should be doing with regard to Islam in our own countries. We don't want to be naive. Yes, we should know. We should know the reality. We should know the truth. But we should not move towards hostility. Muslims are not our, our enemies. Yes, we should love our neighbors and we should try to be, to be cooperative and we should try to be considerate and share our testimony with them and, and work among them. I want to end with um, words from the former Anglican Bishop of Rochester in England, the Right Reverend Dr. Michael Nazir Ali. He's from Pakistani background, Muslim background, came to Britain 
became an Anglican, became an Anglican <clears throat> bishop. Meanwhile, he has converted to the Catholic Church. He has moved on. He's now a Catholic. But still, what he says about, about the issue, I find helpful, and I want to read it to you. It is crucial for Christians to reflect upon and engage with the reality of Islam and to study the different approaches to Muslims and to the world of Islam. Dialogue is about listening to our Muslim friends and learning more about their faith. It's about cooperating in the building of community in a specific place and ensuring peaceful human development. At the national and international levels in particular, Dialogue can be about the recognition and strengthening of fundamental freedoms. Within the bounds of civility, we must discuss the importance of freedom of expression, freedom of belief, and the freedom of change of our beliefs. It's particularly vital to not to think that engagement with Islam and with Muslims is a kind of capitulation. Islam is, of course, a system of beliefs which may seem to have some features in common with the Christian faith, but there are basic and crucial differences as well. Central biblical doctrines such as original sin, incarnation, atonement, the cross and what Jesus did at the cross and resurrection find no place in Islam, divinity, trinity, and so on. And in the end, we find a different doctrine of God. Whatever the difference, we must treat them respectfully. We must, however, distinguish between Islam and the ideologies of Islamism and political Islam. Islamism is a comprehensive political, social, economic system based on a narrow and literalistic interpretation of the fundamental documents of Islam and which wants that Sharia law governs. It has the effect of reducing the basic freedoms of many wherever it has influence and has given birth to extremism, which in turn has produced terrorism in many forms. Loving Muslims and being respectful to their beliefs is one thing, but dealing with Islamist ideologies must be quite another. It is important to encourage those Muslim scholars and leaders who are seeking in Islamic sources interpretations of the Sharia, which help towards the common good, which help towards harmony, towards peace. So much the quote of Bishop, uh, the British Bishop. And I think that's wise counsel. And one la last sentence, personally, I believe, and that's a message to the church, the problem is not the strength of Islam and Muslims or Muslims party. The problem is the strength or the weakness of the church. If, and that makes it our responsibility to disciple Christians well, to teach Christians well, to bring them to maturity, to live a genuine, authentic, loving example as Christians and to be a light in this world and to be salt in this world. Then we will be able to stand against any, anything. Then we don't need to have fear and be afraid. So much. Thank you very much uh, for your wonderful um, presentations and all the information that we have. Um, and we've got the um, one question in the chat box. Um, 
So democratically, what is the religious position of women in Islam? The place of education, inheritance, legal rights and wealth and such likes. You will find in different countries many different positions. Um, because on the one side you have Islam, then you have the pressures of modern life, then you have influences from other cultures, and the same is true for Islam. To give you examples, when I was in Pakistan, some Muslim extremists uh, burned down two uh, is, uh, schools, secondary schools for girls. And they said, girls don't need higher education. You find the same attitude in, in Afghanistan. So you find a type of Islam that would strictly say, no, girls and women, their place is in the home. And if you leave the home, there must be some male besides you. I think that's not necessarily the view in African countries. I think that African women are too strong to just follow that type of uh, example. Um, but you, I mean, if you look to North Africa, Boko Haram basically means the same. Books are forbidden and they don't want to have girls and women be educated. On the other hand, if you look into Saudi Arabia, where you had a similar situation, uh, the Saudis realize we need the women in our economy. And now they are slowly given more rights to women. They are now for the first time allowed to drive a car. Formerly they were not allowed to drive cars. Uh, yes, some years ago, there was the story that a secondary school in Saudi Arabia was burning down. And the fire brigade was there to rescue the girls. And the Muslim extremists called, no, you are not allowed. They don't wear a hijab. You can't take them out without a hijab. And they all burned down. I mean, so you have at times very extreme views um, that has to do with the view of a woman in marriage. Basically, the woman is, the, the, the husband is the ruler. The husband has to, the woman has to obey the husband. According to the Quran, the husband has the right to, 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 to slap, to hit, to beat up his wife. If you look into modern translations, they might turn it, tone it down and say, no, they only slap with the feather. But that's not what the Quran says. So, uh, and because men are superior, so according to strict uh, Sharia law, um, the Afghanistan and Pakistan situation is nearer to the reality of, of their faith, but you will find more and more situations in countries where the women fight for their rights or want to be equal. Uh, you also would have to say even in Pakistan or even in countries where, where women outside the home doesn't have rights. Inside the home, often the woman is, is the ruler and the husband has to do what the woman does. And the woman, uh, I mean, the women are clever. They, they fight for their power in the way that they cherish their sons, particularly the first son, but all the sons. And because the women and their sons make such a strong relationship, 
that gives the women strength uh, against the husband. And, and so on that level, uh, it becomes more balanced. So to come back to the question, you will find situations where basically the woman is a slave and you will find situations in the West where the, the women are feminists and they fight for their rights and they, they, they found their own firms and companies. And uh, in Germany, well, now we have several mosques that are led by women. It's unthinkable in, in Muslim countries. So uh, there are changes, it's changing. And it would depend on the situation in Kenya, uh, whether let's say you would have women politicians or whether all the Muslim women would, would have to wear a chador or a hijab or a burqa or something like that. So it depends on the local situation. And in the local situation, it depends on the community and on the husband. How many rights a woman has or not have. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, uh, is Dr. Joseph around or Reverend Titus? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, it's, it's uh, it's already times over. So, um, so if you have any questions relating to what um, Dito actually has told today, so I'll, what I'll do, I'll just get a full script from Dito and I'll share with yeah. you. So you can ask Dr. Joseph or Reverend Titus to get a script from him. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so um, let me just share. Okay, I'll just give you. In the meantime, allow me to ask uh, Venerable Murage, the Archdeacon Murage, to thank our speaker and uh, the work international as we finish. Venerable Murage, as Leveland does that, you can thank our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Leveland. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tari. I want to take this opportunity to appreciate our speaker for a very well and thoroughly researched presentation, which was done in a way that everybody could hear, could follow, could take notes. It has left us more enlightened, more strengthened, more empowered even to do more and to engage in a more careful manner. That it's not confrontation, but even the acts of our own life can be able to minister to the Muslims. Thank you very much for a good presentation. Thank you. Can I just say a prayer for us? Can I just say a prayer for us? Yes, yes, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us a good day since morning at 8 and up to this time for what you have been able to hear and even as we continue to meditate and to internalize and even get opportunity to practice this. Lord, that your grace, that your blessings continue to be upon us. Thank you for our presenter. Thank you for the whole team. Lord, we pray that your blessings will continue to be with us now and forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. Back to Levland Yahoo. Back to the host. Okay, sure. All right. Okay, so I'll just give you um, 
couple of announcements before we end up the entire session. Okay. Um, so, so our webinar will continue next week. So um, on the same day, day um, Monday, so uh, February 13th. So it'll be starting from 8.45 and there'll be two sessions will be, will be um, going. So um, the first sessions, a speaker, um, as you see on the screen, I myself will be speaking on diaspora missions. And Patrick Johnston, he's the one of the prominent uh, scholars of mission studies in the world. So he wrote um, uh, so many books, as you see on the screen, he'll be speaking on the uh, global missions in the post and uh, pandemic world. So uh, please be uh, with us next way, you can just um, encourage your uh, friends or people or uh, pastors, leaders join next week as well for this session. And um, Dita, would you be able to uh, end up the entire session by prayer? Yes, I will do. Yeah, thank you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, first of all, for Jesus Christ and salvation and forgiveness and new life we have got in you. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we have a hope and that we can look forward, that I as an old man can look forward to one day be with you forever. Thank you for that. And Lord, I want to thank you for that possibility of training, of sharing, of working together, discussing issues. And this morning, the issue of Islam and how to share the gospel, how to, to view Muslims, how to understand Islam. Thank you for this possibility and option. And we pray, Lord, that you would help everyone when encountering Islam, when meeting with Muslims, that by your Holy Spirit and by your love, you would remind people and share their faith, pray for people, or share gospel stories about Jesus Christ. Lord, we want, also want to pray for your peace among the different tribes and groups and religion in uh, Kenya, and that you would help that only those political leaders who are wise, who really want the best of the country, would ever have a say within Kenyan politics. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.